Explore today's must-have trends and innovative styles at Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. Shop one-of-a-kind finds in today's must-have trends. Explore wall-to-wall deals, furniture, flooring, mattresses, home accents, seasonal favorites, and more. Discover unique new home decor, pillows, accessories, and more. There's something perfect for your style and budget. There's new inventory every day at up to 80% off suggested retail. Discover the style and savings of Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man driving a gravy train with biscuit wheels. He is our captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. This week, we've got another great one for you. Featured this week, we have Captain's Log by Cameron's Brewing in beautiful Oakville, Ontario, Canada. Garage grade four out of five bottle caps. Captain's Log is brewed with only the finest malted barley and it's cold aged. It's one smooth, refreshing lager brought to us by our good friends right here. First up, we have Rick and Abby in Klamath, Oregon. And a big shout out to Raina in Napa Valley. Next, we have Tannis in Mount Vernon, Washington. A big we like your jib to Rachel in North Island, New Zealand. And we also have Joe and Jamie from Jacksonville, North Carolina. And last but certainly not least, cheers to Dylan in Liverpool, Ohio. A lot of people don't know that's where the Beatles are originally from. So thanks, everybody, for buying us around for this week's show. If you want to buy the captain around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com. Click on the donate button. And that is enough of the business. That's right, everybody. Gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Now been a full week, a full week since Sean Souter was murdered and still the crime scene at Schroeder and Bennett Places in West Baltimore, it remains taped off at this hour. ABC 2 News investigative reporter Brian Kubler has been on the story and joins us live right now from Baltimore Police Headquarters tonight with a continued search for Souter's killer and those inside and outside the department mourning his loss. Brian? Yeah, Jamie, Sean Souter was only in the homicide unit of the police department for about two years. But in that short time, victims, families became friends and friends became families. Exactly a week later now, and this part of Harlem Park in West Baltimore remains a crime scene, an active one, as forensics were called back out just today. But while technicians revisited Souter's scene, he was more than a um police officer. Kevin Fenwick felt compelled to meet us at his son's crime scene. Kendall Fenwick, you might recall, was murdered two years ago after erecting a fence around his northwest Baltimore home to keep the drug dealers out. A good, hardworking, honest family man, his killing lingers just a little longer in the barrage of what can be Baltimore's violent crime statistics. A cold-blooded killing that would fall to a brand new homicide detective at the time, Kendall Fenwick was Detective Sean Souter's first ever case and first ever closure. He brought comfort to my family knowing that we had this person behind bars. And he always told me I would be there for you. And he has. And he has. 
a true friend. He has. But it didn't stop there. Through the next two years, Souter became family to Fenwick. In all of his relationships, that was just simply the detective's M.O. He was a special, very, very special man. My brother and I, I love him forever. His colleagues say much the same thing. Detective Eric Perez came up in the department with Souter yesterday telling us it's all that he can do from falling apart, balancing such pain with the drive for justice. I have to battle um, the emotion while sticking to, to, to the mission, which is, which is finding who, who killed Sean. So you have to really um, know when to turn that switch on and off so that you can uh, stay on course and, and, and stay focused on what needs to be done. The concept of closure is subjective, it's personal, but there is perhaps no one better equipped to define it than a homicide detective and the family member of a murder victim. For Fenwick, he can only hope the family of the man who worked so hard to give him his closure is afforded the same comfort. It's terrifying, it is, it's, it's speechless, speechless. Just trying to hold myself together now, but um, it's speechless. It's speechless. Meanwhile, in just a few moments here, the Baltimore City Police Department is planning to brief the media of an update in this investigation that is now, as you said, Jamie, exactly one week old tonight. We will bring this press conference to you live as it happens here from City Police Headquarters. For now, we're live at City Police Headquarters in downtown Baltimore this evening. Ryan Kubler, ABC2 News. On November 15, 2017, Detective Sean Souter is 43 years old and an 18-year veteran of the Baltimore Police Department in Maryland. Souter started out as a beat cop and worked his way up through the ranks to earn his detective badge. He was assigned to the Homicide Division back in 2016. We should mention, 2017 was the third straight year in which Baltimore had more than 300 killings, so almost one a day. In fact, the murder rate was so out of control in 2018, city organizers began holding 72-hour ceasefire weekends, a time period when it is not okay to shoot someone. Busy homicide detectives in Baltimore PD traditionally work in pairs, and the detectives do not wear a uniform, but rather a suit and tie. I'm sure everybody's familiar with this. This seems to be the protocol in most cities. Furthermore, unlike Baltimore police officers, Detectives do not wear body cameras. On November 15th, Detective Souter was not working with his regular partner. Souter was paired up with a different partner for the day, and the two headed out to follow up with a possible witness on a triple killing from 2016. The area they went to was the 900 block of Bennett Place in what the Baltimore Sun called, quote, a notoriously violent section of the Harlem Park neighborhood of West Baltimore. Detective Souter was familiar with the Harlem Park neighborhood as he was a patrol officer there at one time. According to the Sun newspaper, the facts of the event is this. Detective Souter and his partner saw a man acting suspiciously in a vacant lot. The two detectives split up to cover different exits of the block, and then Detective Souter was shot. Souter suffered one gunshot wound to the head and was rushed to the University of Maryland Shock Trauma Center. The BPD confirmed the shooting at 5.42 p.m. in an email to the media stating the police department was gathering details regarding the police-involved shooting that occurred at approximately 4.30 p.m. At 9 p.m., Detective Souter was in critical condition. A news conference featuring Police Commissioner Kevin Davis outlined the details of the incident without releasing the detective's name. According to Davis, the detective approached a man engaged in suspicious behavior in an attempt to speak with him when he was shot. Davis described the attack as spontaneous. He continued, our 18-year veteran homicide detective was shot in the head. The detective was in very, very grave condition, and he continues to fight for his life. Sadly, the detective, Sean Souter, died the next day. On November 16th, in the presence of his wife and five children. 
Doctors desperately tried to save the life of the respected officer they knew personally, but they were unsuccessful. Commissioner Davis released Sean Souter's name to the public in a news conference announcing his death. Davis told the media that police found evidence that the suspect was injured, but declined to elaborate on this statement. He said police were searching emergency rooms and doctor's offices for anyone with any unexplained injuries. The Maryland state flag was lowered to half staff and within days a reward of $215,000 was offered for information on the case. In the wake of Detective Souter's murder, officials from all over Maryland declared that they would make it their mission to find Detective Souter's killer. We will find the person responsible for this ridiculous, absurd, unnecessary loss of life, said Commissioner Davis. He described Detective Souter as a wonderful detective, husband, father, and friend. Davis employed citizens to help the police. Bring this heartless, ruthless, soulless killer to justice, he asked. The immediate investigation. So, Captain, for hours after Souter was shot, police maintained a wide perimeter around the 900 block of Bennett Place while officers checked nearby homes for the shooter. Police helicopters circled overhead looking for suspects. The day after the shooting, police fanned out across the neighborhood knocking on doors to ask neighbors if they knew anything about the shooting or the shooter. They corridored off the whole block, questioning all the residents and looked in all of the homes there. Residents expressed concern that they were often detained when coming and going regardless of probable cause, required to show ID and pat it down. This aggressive zoning off of the area was later declared by the media and public to be unconstitutional, and this lasted for six days after the shooting. The lockdown caused complaints from residents, to say the very least. Which is, this is a sticky situation because you don't want anybody's rights to be infringed on. But at the same time, you have an officer that was killed in your area trying to protect and serve your area. So it's like you should be a little more cooperative, possibly, with this investigation. I think describing this as a sticky situation is spot on by you, Captain. Good job by you. It, It is very difficult. And it's difficult for me to have an opinion on this because on one side, I want to say, you know what? They're looking for a cop killer and we should do everything we can to find whoever killed this police officer. Right. But at the other hand, it's, it's tough because I don't live in that neighborhood. You know, I've never had my neighborhood blocked off for six, six days and be patted down and asked to show ID every time I come and go from my home well, or my, right. my neighborhood. And that's infringing on your rights. So I, I think you're allowed to have an opinion. It sucks on both sides. Yeah, it's it, yeah, it's a terrible situation. So who was Sean Souter? Well, Souter's colleagues remembered him as a dependable investigator who was often smiling. And that's one thing that in the research here that I found time and time again, everybody said how much this guy was, he was always smiling, always kind of in a good, you know, good mannered guy, good natured guy. Jonathan Jones, Souter's regular partner, said Souter loved the Dallas Cowboys He was known amongst detectives as Face on the street. Uh, Citizens knew him as... Face. Yeah, that was his his nickname. But I guess citizens on the street called him Scar. Now, both of this referred to a facial scar that uh, Souter had. And then when you put them together, you get what? Scarface. Yeah. That would have been the cooler name. Rick Willard, a retired officer, said he, meaning Souter, is one of the best officers I've ever worked with, and it breaks my heart. Former Baltimore prosecutor Jeremy Eldridge called Souter a man with integrity. He continued, Souter was one person you would always count on. He worked tirelessly to put together very well thought out cases. Souter was born and raised in Washington, D.C. He enlisted in the Army after high school and served until 1998. He joined the Baltimore Police Department in 1999 but was called back to serve in Iraq as a member of the Army Reserves from 2005 to 2007. At the time of his death, he lived in York County, Pennsylvania, about an hour's commute to Baltimore. He was married and had five children. It seems like a more common thing lately that these cops don't live in the areas that they work in. but They'll actually live an hour or more away. Yeah, and here's the thing is, I I know that in some areas they're required to live in the areas that they serve or within a certain mile radius of that area. 
that area of the country, DC, Baltimore, heavily congested. And you also have high crime rates in those cities as well. And then the nicer neighborhoods, extremely expensive to live in. So I I don't know that his salary would provide him a good home and a safe neighborhood in that area. I just want to warn everybody to pay attention because the information that we're going to give you, it it kind of trickles out over time, Mm -hmm. but you don't want to forget about the information that happened beforehand. Mm -hmm. That's going to play a key role in this case. And, And I'm telling you, the more we dive into this case, the more that you're going to think we made this up. Yeah. I mean, this case will blow your mind. Well, and the information coming out in a trickle is is exactly right. Because from the get-go, the police commissioner, he held an unprecedented number of news conferences about the shooting. Actually, there were seven press conferences in the first 10 days of the investigation. Yeah. And some have wondered why so many press conferences. Was this an attempt to control the narrative or the release of information about what happened. So here are the details that were officially released by the Baltimore Police Department concerning the shooting death of Detective Souter. This is in the first 10 days. Souter was found in the vacant lot of Bennett Place lying face down. Police recovered Detective Souter's service weapon at the scene. It was found underneath his body. Souter had his police radio clutched in his left hand. More than one shot had been fired from Souter's gun. Detective Souter had been killed with his own weapon. I'll repeat that. Detective Souter had been killed with his own weapon. There was evidence that a struggle occurred. The detective's killer might have been injured in the course of that struggle. One strange turn of events also came to light. Detective Souter was not transported to the shock trauma center via ambulance. Instead, Officers at the scene put him in a police vehicle and drove him to the hospital, which was less than a mile away. This presumably to save time instead of waiting for an ambulance. Right. Now, unbelievably, while en route, this police vehicle got into an accident, colliding with a civilian car. Souter was then transferred to an ambulance at that scene of the accident and then taken to the shock trauma center. Let's try to get an understanding of exactly where Detective Souter's body was found. He lay on the ground in a vacant lot between two houses. From photos of the scene, you can see it looks like almost an alcove between buildings. Windows in the surrounding houses overlook the lot. They appear to be boarded up. So there's a lot of vacant homes in this area. The area has been described as a place where drug-addicted homeless and squatters would hang out. This is an L-shaped lot that is open to Bennett Place on one side of the lot and to Schroeder Street on the other end of the L-shaped lot. So there are two ways to access this vacant lot. Within days of the shooting, a makeshift memorial of flowers, American flags, and mementos sprung up on the corner of the vacant lot in honor of Sean Souter. Detective Souter's autopsy was completed within five days of the killing. The autopsy officially ruled that his death was a homicide. Baltimore police investigators returned to the scene of the shooting to investigate further based on what they learned from the autopsy about the bullet trajectory. Police said they found additional significant evidence which turned out to be the fatal bullet. It was lodged in the dirt in the vacant lot, and it had Detective Souter's DNA on it. The discovery of this bullet in the lot by evidence techs appears to some to have been somewhat staged. The discovery happened in front of rolling TV news cameras with what seemed like deliberate displays of the bullet. Police disclosed that in total, three shots were fired from Souter's gun, and one of these was a close contact gunshot wound to Souter's head. Police said they found no DNA or other evidence at the scene that might lead them to the perpetrator. But earlier reports stated police found evidence that the perp was injured at the scene. Okay, so we have a situation where the law enforcement officer, Detective Souter, is shot in the head. Mm -hmm. There's three bullets because there's three shots. Correct. The bullet that hit his head, that hit the Detective Souter's head, they 
possibly, when they find the bullet, find this and the media is there. Mm-hmm. So they're going to be holding this up. We found the bullet. Right. Okay. Well, and the reason why some have stated that they believe it might be staged is that, so the autopsy, it took five days. They had, remember, they blocked off that whole area for six days total after the shooting. And what, what the people in the public are going, well, you had this area blocked off for all this time and you didn't find the bullet until after the autopsy five days later. And then when you do find it, you're kind of like, I mean, prayed in around. Well, yeah, Yeah. you're almost holding it up like some kind of trophy or something like that. That's very strange. Yeah. But the other key thing there is that they state that no DNA or other evidence at the scene might lead them to find the perpetrator. But we have an earlier statement by police that stated they found evidence that the perp was injured at the scene. So that's conflicting things, but they clean it up a little bit with what they find to be good evidence to steer them in the right direction. So what they found originally that may have led them to believe that the perpetrator was injured at the scene, this turned out to be two blood stains found in the vacant lot. One of the blood samples was determined to have been from an animal. And one was from a local junkie who was interviewed and ruled out. So the theory that the suspect had been injured in the struggle turned out to be baseless. Baltimore Police Department, they had no suspects in the killing of one of their own. Well, we don't need blood stains or puddles of blood in this alley. What we do have is we do have two bullets that did not hit Detective Suter. Mm-hmm. So were those bullets, when we look at those bullets, did they, did they hit anybody? Do they have any DNA evidence on them? And I think this would tell us if there was somebody injured in the attack on Detective Suter. Yeah, and you brought that up at the perfect time because the earlier information that was coming out was just very, it was a little vague, stating that there was more than one shot fired from Detective Suter's gun. It was later determined that three shots were fired from Suter's own service weapon. And this came about when Commissioner Davis announced that three shell casings were recovered that ballistically matched Suter's gun. He pointed out that these findings did not necessarily mean that no other gun was present or was fired, but the casings were found very close to Suter's body. Police also pointed out, pointed to a scuffle mostly because dirt was found on Souter's suit. So the conclusion was that Detective Souter was attacked and overpowered by someone, his gun taken or at least controlled, and three shots fired with one hitting Souter fatally in the head. Now you were talking about that him and his partner were tracking down a guy that was suspicious in the area. Mm -hmm. The, The report says that they saw someone behaving suspiciously in the area and Souter decided to approach this individual. Right. So then I'm assuming at that point that this is our suspect. Mm -hmm. So do we have a, any ID of this guy? Do we have any, a description of the potential suit shooter or someone who overpowered Sean Souter? Right. Well, see, this is difficult because like you said, we're going off of probably just a description of this suspicious person. There doesn't seem to be any witnesses that actually saw the shooting or the scuffle take place. Right. But we do have his partner that saw this suspicious individual Mm -hmm. in the beginning. And this is interesting. We also have Baltimore police department. They're refusing to release the detective's name that was working with Souter that day. It took a while for that information to come out. And they also refuse to say what he had told investigators other than the suspect was a black man wearing a black and white jacket. Well, right. But I'm I think, sure that narrows it down quite a bit. Right. But I think what they're assuming there is, hey, we have one suspect right now. That's probably the guy. Mm-hmm. And then we have one eyewitness. And now that Souter is dead, we don't want to release this information. We don't want to release what he has told us because we don't want a hit put out on this guy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because that's your only eyewitness. Well, two weeks after Souter's death, the Baltimore Sun released the name of the detective working with Souter that day, and this is Detective David Bomenka. Uh, Not much is known 
about this detective from what I could find in the papers. Uh, but reportedly he and detective Souter worked at least one case together previous to this shooting. Uh, this detective was a 10 year Baltimore police department veteran. Then additional information came out. Commissioner Davis stated that on the day of the shooting, Bomenka and Souter were canvassing the 900 block of Bennett place while investigating a 2016 triple homicide case. Now this case was Souter's case that they were working, not Bomenka's case. They had no particular person of interest in their focus on that day for that outing. According to the commissioner, Bomenka was also investigating a separate murder case that he was staffed on. The way this reads to me, Captain, is that they are in this area and they're both working these cases together by this point because they've now been paired up. Right. You know, detectives, thank God they get a day off like everybody else. Apparently, it was Souter's partner's day off. Apparently, he and Bomenka were paired up the day before as well. Right. And when you say he, you're talking about Souter. So Souter and Bomenka work together. This would be the second day in a row. Correct. That's my understanding. According to the commissioner, and this is, this has to have come from Bomanka. This is his account of what was going on at the time of the shooting. The commissioner says that both detective Souter and his partner, meaning Bomanka saw a person behaving suspiciously. There were two observations of this suspicious person. One occurred 20 minutes prior, meaning the shooting prior to the shooting. And one occurred just moments before the shooting. The detectives did not engage this suspicious person the first time they saw this person. Now, in between the two sightings, the officers were in a different area. But to be clear, Bomeka was not in the presence of Detective Souter when the struggle went down or when the shots took place. This case is just getting started, but first, a quick beer break. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Explore today's must-have trends and innovative styles at Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. Shop one-of-a-kind finds in today's must-have trends. Explore wall-to-wall deals, furniture, flooring, mattresses, home accents, seasonal favorites, and more. Discover unique new home decor, pillows, accessories, and more. There's something perfect for your style and budget. There's new inventory every day at up to 80% off suggested retail. Discover the style and savings of Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. All right, cheers, mates. How about a quick captain recap? So what we have going on in this case is we have Detective Souter and his partner go out. We have a suspicious individual. Now we have Detective Souter dead. And we have law enforcement saying, hey, we're locking down this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We're going to check anybody coming in and out. And we have award money for a possible cop killer. $215,000 for information leading to the perpetrator of the killer of Sean Souter. 
And this case continued to be investigated as a homicide with police pursuing all leads. But startling new information came to light about two weeks after Detective Sean Souter was killed that merged his unsolved murder case with another high profile case rocking the city of Baltimore. This new information suddenly changed the way people were looking at things and introduced new potential theories regarding Souter's death on November 30th. So 15 days after detective Souter was shot, a federal grand jury handed down an indictment of a Baltimore police sergeant and several officers on the force. What was learned is that detective Souter was scheduled to testify in front of this grand jury on the day after he was shot. So on November 16th, 2017, Souter was scheduled to be a witness against Sergeant Wayne Jenkins in the federal criminal case. And Souter had multiple texts and phone calls with his lawyer in the two days before he was shot. His lawyer was seeking a meeting, presumably to discuss his testimony that would never come to be. But even without Souter, the case was a slam dunk. Federal prosecutors had the goods on a slew of crooked cops, including wiretapping recordings where the crooked detectives admitted to various illegal activities, including selling drugs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that everything is nice and messy, let's talk something through before we go any further, because even though police are looking for a cop killer, Mm -hmm. those outside of the department are saying, wait a minute, this is a mysterious death. This detective's death is likely more of a mystery than first thought. All right. So the most basic breakdown of theories and there are three, is this. One, Sean Souter was murdered. A suspicious random person killed him, Mm -hmm. to which police gave a vague description of, and per the autopsy determination of homicide, police were still pursuing the unknown gunman. Two, this kind of started with the media. Sean Souter may have taken his own life. It was determined he was killed with his service weapon by close contact gunshot wound, and the gun was found under his body. Mm -hmm. three. So then you have what some of the public were thinking. Sean Souter was set to testify against corruption inside the police force and detectives he worked with or for, and he was silenced and his death was a hit. He was murdered potentially by one of his own. Right. Let's look more at detective Wayne Jenkins, the one that was uh, the sergeant who was indicted. Jenkins was the supervisor in charge of the Gun Trace Task Force, a group of Baltimore law enforcement officers tasked with getting guns off of the streets. Federal authorities brought down a wide-ranging indictment that alleged members of the task force engaged in a pattern of corruption, including robbing citizens, framing people, stealing confiscated drugs, and then reselling them. They were also falsifying court reports and earning fraudulent overtime pay. Mm -hmm. Six gun trace task force officers pled guilty to these charges. Two others did not resulting in their trials. Wayne Jenkins, the leader of the gun trace task force was charged with racketeering, conspiracy, robbery, illegal use of a firearm. Well, like we talked about on the phone a little bit, this seems really when you start investigating this aspect of the case, it very much seems like the movie training day yes and in in parts of american gangster as well yeah and when you watch that movie you think to yourself there is no way this would happen in real life and then you see a case brought to light like this and you start going well maybe uh, a movie like that hits closer to home than we would we wish it would yeah and for those of the people listening that are not familiar with sean Souter's case This is not our speculation. This happened. This is real life. It happened. We have individuals that pled guilty Mm -hmm. and others that were later found guilty. So the gun trace task force was essentially a rogue unit comprised of corrupt officers disguised as an elite force of public protectors. According to Vox magazine, the police officers in the unit engaged in a years long pattern of criminal activities. They set people up for baseless searches They robbed people of drugs and guns, among other things. Mm -hmm. They clocked overtime when they weren't working at all. In fact, when they were on vacation or on leave, they were billing the department for overtime pay. They used illegally 
placed GPS trackers to locate and rob drug dealers and others. They planted evidence and filmed themselves finding it. Well, they, as far as, hold on. So as far as the overtime, I'm assuming that this is like a task force that is run by itself. Meaning that if you, let's say I'm the boss, right? Because mm-hmm. there's no way I'm working for you. But let's just say I'm the boss. Okay. You're and, Sergeant Wayne Jenkins in this portion of the story, I guess. Okay. Say I'm a flaming pile of shit. But you work for me and you say I'm going on vacation, but I want paid. Mm-hmm. Well, you just submit your timesheet to me and then I submit it to the department, like the head department. Yeah, because you could sign off on it and then submit it to to the department itself. Right, so then if I wanted something done, nobody's double-checking my work either. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how we don't know if these guys were corrupt before they joined the task force, but once they become a part of this task force, they go, hey, we run things a little different here. You want to get paid while you're not working? We can help you do that. Right. And and while you're doing that, you're also going to turn the other way why we take dr- uh, we take drugs from drug dealers and sell them mm-hmm. uh, or or rob them for their money or whatever. Right. So it's it's a separate unit and and I think that's very important. It wasn't like there was a lot of checks and balances to make sure these guys weren't doing corrupt things. Right. If that makes any sense. For the most part, it, it it appears that what they were doing, a large part of what they were doing was stealing from people that had no recourse against the police. Right. You know, they're going after people that are doing petty crimes, selling drugs, may, you know, making money off of drugs. And if you're a drug dealer and I'm a an officer mm-hmm. of the law and I go and shake you down and rob you of all your drug money. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to go file a police report saying, hey, this officer stole my drug money. Right. You know, it just, it doesn't work out. They participated in some home invasions as well, what have been classified as home invasions. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's kicking in the door of a known drug dealer and stealing their weapons, money, and drugs. In total, the Gun Trace Task Force members are suspected of stealing at least $300,000 in cash, three kilos of cocaine, 43 pounds of marijuana, 800 grams of heroin, and jewelry worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wow. Now, the indictment of Wayne Jenkins related, among other things, to an arrest he made in 2010 on a case where he was partnered with Sean Souter. The two detectives were investigating large-scale drug dealers. Souter and Jenkins became involved in an unmarked vehicle pursuit of another car driven by one Umar Burley. Basically, Umar Burley says he believed that the officers were trying to rob him, so he fled. And now we have a car chase. Right. Burley crashed into another car. The driver of that car was Albert Davis, an 87-year-old father of a Baltimore police officer. He was killed, and his wife was seriously injured. Mm-hmm. After the accident, Souter and Jenkins arrested Burley. And Jenkins directed Souter to search Burley's vehicle. According to the federal indictment documents, unbeknownst to Souter, Jenkins had planted drugs in Burley's car. Souter found 28 grams of heroin in the vehicle. So this is to justify the car chase right. that sends Burley and an associate who was also in the car to prison for federal drug offenses. After Souter's death, U.S. Attorney Stephen Shenning said the federal prosecutors did not get a chance to discuss Souter's testimony with him prior to his death. Souter was offered limited immunity to testify about Umar Bradley's case, but we don't know what else the grand jury would have asked him about or where his testimony would have led the investigation. Police Commissioner Davis held a press conference and said, quote, what this indictment outlines in great detail is the fact that Sean Souter wasn't involved in any way, shape, or form in any criminal misconduct whatsoever, end quote. However, it appears that Sean Souter was actually potentially in a lot of trouble. There was a federal grand jury investigation into corrupt cops that extended to the highest levels of the police force. Souter worked closely and at length with several of the named corrupt cops. Over the course of his career, Souter worked extensively with at least three of the officers indicted in connection with the corruption of the gun trace task force. I know you're speaking English, but it doesn't make any sense to me. So what you're saying 
on one hand is that they're saying Souter had nothing to do with this. The police commissioner says uh, the police commissioner is saying he he did nothing wrong. Mm-hmm. And then, but you're also saying, hey, he was going to testify, and we're going to offer him limited amounts of immunity, right? Meaning, well, he did something wrong where they're going to give him immunity for. But are there other things that they're not going to give him immunity for? So it's that's very confusing. Okay, so I'm kind of just dissecting this myself and, and giving my uh, opinion here on what that means. My guess is that they spoke to him about some of his testimony, what he was going to be willing to testify towards against these officers. Right. Okay, so we're going to say you have immunity on those particular aspects of our investigation. However, during the course of your your testimony, you could be asked any number of questions that could go outside of the box, that could go away from those particular cases, those particular aspects mm-hmm. of their investigation. Yeah. In the course of that, we may learn new information that now we figure out you're not completely on the up and up, Mr. Souter, and right. we can pursue charges against you for information later learned. Now, what the commissioner is is saying in a lot of words, basically, when you break that down, is Souter was there to rat out these other officers, mm-hmm. that his testimony wasn't, he wasn't going to be put on the stand in front of the grand jury because he was under investigation. He's simply going to be there to testify because we need witnesses to this illegal activity. A lot of this illegal activity is going down and the only people witnessing it are other corrupt cops right? and criminals, known criminals that they are victimizing. So basically they're saying once we get you on the stand and we yell, we want the truth. And I ask you, can you handle the truth? And then I tell you that I issued a code red that I still might go to jail for that. Right. He could be open. He could open himself up to investigation per his testimony. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not like it's not a situation where they go, okay, here's these 10 questions. This is what we're going to ask you. And that's it. And that's all. No, it's you are, you are there and you are to give us your knowledge of anything we ask you questions about. It could be anything at all. Right. But on top of that, we have the chief of police saying, hey, based on what we know and based on what we believe that he did not do any illegal criminal activity as a law enforcement officer. Correct. That's what the commissioner is saying. Now, where people call that into question is Souter's lengthy career. Stating, you know, he would have worked with some of these individuals at some point in his career. Now, let's name a few of them. We know he worked with Wayne Jenkins, who was pretty much the ringleader of this of these corrupt cops. Right. He, He's the Denzel Washington in Training Day. Yeah. He also worked with or Josh Brolin from uh, American Gangster. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, he also worked with detectives Maurice Ward and Mamadou Gondo. So Ward and Gondo both pled guilty to federal charges. Mm -hmm. So now we have to wonder what that leaves the public wondering about. What did Sean Souter know about these illicit activities and his fellow detectives? Did he know and just choose to look the other way? Was he in fact ratting them out like the commissioner would have us believe? Or did he participate joining in with these corrupt officers and being in on the take? Right. Or was it? Again, like training day, what a lot of things that happened was Denzel Washington's character would set up Ethan Hawke's character Mm -hmm. and say, hey, go ahead and rep me out. Go ahead and tell them I did this. And they're going to drug test you. And guess what? You got PCP in your system. Mm -hmm. So, again, it could be one of those situations where we don't know what Suter is going to say because is Suter going to not say certain things, therefore not incriminating himself. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. And and, and just to give you a little uh, thought of where my feelings were when researching this case, Mm -hmm. right from the get-go, in the very beginning, I'm like, oh, my God, this guy was a hero. He was a a veteran officer, a a well-respected homicide detective out just doing a good job, and he was killed in the line of duty. Right. And then... You find out about all this corruption and you start to wonder, was he just another dirty cop in this big story here? Right. And 
the thing that I had to kind of remind myself of is what you just talked about training day where Ethan Hawke is almost forced into a position he never thought he would be in. He was, he just wanted to be in that drug task force. Right. And he gets in there and he finds out they're doing illegal activity. And Denzel Washington's like, you're going to go along with this. Right. And, uh, and, and at you, the we're going to force movie, you to, we're going to bully you into doing our illegal activity. Right. And at the end of the day, you go, Oh, well, Ethan Hawke, his character, good guy mm-hmm. saves the day. But if you go back through that movie, there's a lot of stuff that was incriminating or criminal activity that he took place in. And so, therefore, he could still get in trouble for that. Training Day. I know we're getting sidetracked here, but Training Day is one of my favorite. That's a great movie. Like King Kong ain't got shit on me. Rarely can I go back and watch a movie multiple times. Training Day, I've watched multiple times. And here is when you, for me, this is when I know somebody's like a extremely fine actor Denzel Washington who I I mean I'm a big fan of I've watched many of his movies but when an actor can become a bad guy when he's playing a bad guy and he's you're not used to him being a bad guy Mm -hmm. and he does it so well that you want to punch him in the face that's an actor that's a damn face a damn fine actor right there in the face I'm going on record right here. I want to punch Denzel Washington's character in, in the, the face. face, in the face. Now to date, captain mm-hmm. six indicted detectives have pled guilty and been sentenced. The ringleader, Wayne Jenkins got 25 years clap, clap T- two detectives who pled not guilty were convicted by a federal jury on several federal charges. Mm-hmm. Here's the other sketchy thing though here it's unclear whether sean Souter was ever actually part or a part of the gun trace task force there are reports out there that says he was early on but asked to be removed from this task force. right again and again look that's a sticky situation because if you are a good cop and you see bad stuff happening and these guys are doing really bad stuff we're talking about stealing drugs stealing money we're talking about robbing uh, gang members. We're talking about robbing drug dealers. Mm-hmm. We're talking about planning evidence on those people after you arrest them. I mean, this is some bad stuff. So if you're in that situation, you can't just go, "Hey, hey, uh, Sarge, uh, well, I don't, I don't like what's going on here. Uh, can you? Uh, I'm going to have to arrest you. Uh, you know, take you in. Mm-hmm. No, you can't do that. You have to go. Mm, this is some bad stuff going on." Let me get out of this department. Well, and here's the thing, too. When you really dive into what these corrupt members of the task force were doing, it's almost like at some point they became completely out of control themselves, like in Training Day, like in American Gangster, where these rogue cops, all of a sudden, they, they are, like you said, King Kong ain't got nothing on me. There's nobody bigger than me. I can do whatever I want. That, that, yeah. that at some point... That is the behavior that took over. There's, in fact, there's one story of these corrupt cops where they are breaking up a riot, okay? And the rioters were looting the area. And after they broke up the riot and made some arrest, these officers decided to keep and steal, basically steal the looted items from the rioters. Oh, right. So if the rioters stole TVs and stuff, they went... Yeah, oh, we, we're not going to give these back. Well, you, you just go, we can't find it. You know, we, right, we don't yeah. know what happened to this. Stuff. <laughs> we don't know where those TVs went. And if anybody wants to know what it's like to drink with the colonel, all you have to do is watch that scene of King Kong ain't <laughs> shit on me. When I, mean, that's, that, I mean, that's that's basically that's, an impersonation yeah. of you when, when you're at the peak of drunkness. I become bulletproof. I still think, you know, Listen up, people. When you ride in and say, I'd love to have a beer with the captain, you're making a mistake. Okay, because first of all, I like to do the shots. You're not going to be able to keep up. But second of all, I'm not the party animal of the group. It's the colonel. He becomes the Kentucky Fried... No, what's the one? Extra crispy SB, colonel. <laughs> extra crisp. Hey, I wish I had that tan. If you don't believe me, come see us at CrimeCon. Uh, in New Orleans this year. Yeah, we have our uh, our code. Yeah, what's our promo code? We have a promo code on our website, and we'll mention that at the end of the show. 
you can get a discount on your CrimeCon tickets using that code. Yeah, but anyways, the evidence will be at CrimeCon, and you'll see video footage and, and pictures, and you will know that the extra crispy colonel is, is alive and well. Is that's, that's the one you want to party with. Well, but so just to kind of clean this up, though. Yeah. You know, from an outsider's perspective, you have to wonder was you you have one of two things. Either Sean Souter was an awesome cop, was very good at his job, was a clean cop, mm-hmm. or you do have there is enough stuff out there to wonder if he wasn't so on the up and up. And a lot of that is a is a leap. A lot of that is a jump. But what that comes from is knowing that he worked with at least three of these detectives that were later convicted. Yeah, but look at these guys that were convicted. They got what they deserve, time in prison. And if Detective Souter was a dirty cop, he would have got, we would have found evidence of of this and we would have, he would have done time. And that's, he would have got what he deserved. This is not what he deserved. Right. No matter if he was a dirty cop or not. He's he's killed in the line of duty, and we don't know why, mm. or a possible suicide. Mm. I mean, this is very strange. Well, and the way that these little, the way that these gangs work, whether they be cop, bad cops, or real, you know, street gangs or anything like that, mm-hmm. most of the time, the way that this works is they bust one guy. They get some information from this one guy. He starts talking. Now they got other people to investigate. They start pulling other people in and these corrupt cops, most of them gave a wealth of information about what was going on. That's what led to them pleading guilty to these charges and others being convicted who didn't plead guilty. Now, out of all of those officers, it's my understanding that only one of them was implicating Sean Souter in having any involvement at all with this group. After the November 30th, 2017 indictments against members of the Gun Trace Task Force, the U.S. Attorney's Office filed a petition to vacate the federal convictions of Umar Burley and his associate. Those were the two involved in the car chase and later the car accident that led to the older man's death. They vacated this because it was proved that the drugs were planted on them and that they were not actually guilty of the crimes they were convicted of. When the indictments were handed down, Commissioner Davis disbanded the gun trace task force, describing the indicted officers as 1930s style gangsters. Now 3000 past cases handled by the unit members have been called into question and who knows how many convictions will be thrown out. Hundreds have already been vacated. Yeah. Clearly, Davis did not do a good job, the commissioner, of overseeing the police department. This is because, obviously, this rogue unit was allowed to run rampant for years under his watch. This would eventually end Davis's career. But before so, Commissioner Davis stated in a press conference that he only learned of Souter's planned grand jury testimony after Souter's death. He also stated that Investigating officers found no connection between Detective Souter's murder and his planned testimony. He also said that Souter was not the target of the federal investigation, which was confirmed by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Davis said there was no information he was aware of that indicated that Detective Souter was anything other than a stellar detective, great friend, loving husband, and great father. Commissioner Davis wrote a highly publicized letter to FBI Director Christopher Wray, formally requesting that the FBI take over the shooting of Detective Souter investigation. Davis said that it was because he suspected that there was information about the murder that the feds had access to that the Baltimore Police Department did not. FBI involvement was supported by Souter's family. Nicole Souter, Souter's widow, apparently told the mayor that she supported the FBI taking over the case. Yeah, and this is because once people start leaning towards this idea that Detective Souter took his own life, mm-hmm. this is something that she she welcomed investigation. Right. But also, you're going to have people investigate a case where he was possibly involved in wrongdoings mm-hmm. with other officers and you're going to have that department. How can you trust that department to 
head this investigation. Right. So, okay. Now, the FBI doesn't want to head the investigation. Yeah, so to be clear, they agreed to assist in the investigation, but they publicly stated they did not want to lead the investigation. But fine with me, right? If I'm if I'm a loved one, fine with me. At least they're involved. And if they're involved, I'm going to trust the investigation a lot more. This is coming from his his widow, which talked to him, I believe, within an hour of his death. Right. And so she was on the phone and they were talking about some video where he was you know, dancing or something mm-hmm. and somebody took, uh, you know, caught him dancing and they're making fun of it, you know, and just joking around. And she just said that he seemed very normal. Mm-hmm. So we have this cop that we, it's, it's so weird because we have so many people saying this guy's a good cop and a good, and a good dude. On top of that, his wife is saying he wasn't suicidal. Right. And then you start going, well, again, do you get any benefits or is his family going to get any benefits? I mean, it was it wasn't just him and his wife. They had a lot. Five, of, they had five children. A lot of kids. So the thing here is, you know, when when this came forward that this is a possible suicide rather than a homicide, Souter's family has been extremely vocal, saying we believe it was a homicide. We believe that there's evidence to point that would indicate that it was a homicide. And they've been extremely vocal about that. And you know what? Commissioner Davis is obviously a flawed commissioner. We know that we have this rogue task force that is out there doing whatever the hell they want under his watch. But I'm sure throughout his career, he did do a good deal of good things along the way. Right. Now, one thing. Well, and mind you, I mean, there's hundreds of officers. So the idea that you have one person that's responsible for all those officers you, how anybody gets out of that job with a good name I, w- I don't know how it happens you can't babysit every officer every minute of the right. day it's you're one person now one thing i think we should give credit to commissioner davis for this was before he was fired is requesting the fbi come in and take over this investigation yeah that to me shows a couple of things it shows smarts on his part because one he wants to be transparent He knows that he has a police department that is under the scrutiny of the public's eye, which they should be because they, some members and we shady, we need to be very clear about that. Some members of the police department were very much guilty of illegal activities. Some members were shady. That's, that's a a hardcore fact. Mm -hmm. So commissioner Davis bringing in the FBI is a couple of things. One to be transparent and it could not hurt to have an outside agency take a good look at this investigation, to take a good look at this case and try to solve it for them. Yeah, and then on the other spectrum of it too, you know, like I said, if you commit suicide, I don't think you're getting, I don't think the officer's family is going to get support. I don't think they're going to get certain benefits. Mm -hmm. But if he is killed on the line of duty, they're taken care of mm-hmm. and pretty well. So then one could argue, are they just saying, hey, it's impossible that he'd kill himself because they benefit from that. And that's something that you have to look into. I believe by watching in- the interviews with his widow that she she just wants the truth to be told. Right. I don't think she cares about the benefits or not. Well, after Commissioner Davis was eventually fired, he was replaced as police commissioner in January of 2018 by veteran Daryl D'Souza. D'Souza lasted less than six months as the police commissioner. He stepped down in May after being indicted for federal tax evasion. One thing D'Souza did before he departed, (laughs) he set up an independent review board to look into the unsolved killing of Detective Souter. So thanks to everybody for joining us in the garage today. We'll be right back at you tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.
can live out your master chef dreams. When you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside, repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that.